Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to the Ron Paul Liberty Report. Today, I have with me Daniel Wake Adams, who is the Executive Director for the Institute for Peace and Prosperity. Daniel, welcome to our program. Thank you, sir. It's good to be here. Well, good. There's a couple things we want to talk about today that's been in the news, and, uh, and we want to give a little different perspective than most people get on evening news and evening TV. The first is this uh, issue of vaccinations. I mean, it's incessant, you know, on the, on the TV. And uh, if, if anybody in public arena says that they are somewhat questioning, you know, the use of vaccines, they are practically stereotyped as being totally insane, <laughs> which I happen uh, to disagree with. Have you been following this issue at, at all on uh, uh, what's been happening here? I have, and as a matter of fact, what I noticed on the social media is there is almost an aggression toward people who make a choice not to vaccinate themselves or children. It's almost a mob mentality that's come up. Yeah, and, and you know, one thing I don't think I've heard yet, which I think is the most important issue, obviously, and, and that is uh, the freedom issue. Whose responsibility is it? You know, whether it's education, medical care, or who gets uh, vaccines, it's always assumed government knows best. And, and it has to be the same way for everybody, and the government makes an announcement, and uh, everybody has to obey. Yet, if you understood the freedom principle, uh, which a growing number of Americans are now starting to understand, that we realize or should make the point that parents are responsible, or we ourselves as individuals are responsibility for our own bodies, that we own our bodies, and not, not the government. Sure. The message almost has to get across, uh, similar to the, uh, to, the use of, to the marijuana message, that you may not endorse the use of it, however you endorse, endorse the right of a person to use their body as they wish. Yeah, that's absolutely true. But, you know, I've dealt with this issue for a while. Uh, I was first elected to Congress in a special election in 1976, and that's when Gerald Ford was president. And one of his first crises he had to deal with was, as president was the swine flu. It was going to be an epidemic. Thousands of Americans were going to die. So he, he gets out and shows he's getting a shot, and, and they want an appropriation to give everybody a shot in the United States and be vaccinated against this horrible, horrible uh, disease that's coming. And uh, the vote came up, Larry McDonald, another physician, a Democrat from, uh, uh, from uh, Georgia, he and I voted against it. So we, I think we were the only two doctors in the Congress, so it, it just turned out that we, we, did, we thought, well, it's not their business, and who knows what's going to happen. And you know what happened on that. That turned out to be a big farce. You know, there, were, uh, there was a breakout in Fort Dix in New Jersey, and uh, there were... Um, it never spread any place, and yet everybody, they got this appropriation, they got this shot, and can you believe it? There were drug companies behind the motivation to sell vaccine, <laughs> but, but the results were pretty, pretty clear cut. You know, there were um, 500 to people who, who ended up getting Guillain-Barre syndrome from this, which is very, very serious. This, this is... This is a disease that uh, can come naturally, there, uh, you know, uh, and it can be viral, but it's a result of this virus that they get uh, when they get the shot. You become paralyzed. You could be paralyzed your whole body. Fortunately, most people get over it, but it, it, it's unnecessary if you're getting a swine flu shot that, that there was no need for. But uh, there were 25 people who died from the shot. Nobody died from the swine flu, and there were these 500 cases. And yet they still say the parents have no responsibility. Listen to the government. And you know, more and more information is coming out now about government making these mandates on medical care, whether it's taking medication for um, clogged arteries in the heart and, and nutritional products and all. It's, it, that is the, the principle that I think it, is so wrong. And of course, it's rotten that uh, anybody who takes a different position on this are also practically un-American and they're, they're, they're insane. But this, this measles uh, uh, business that's going on, you know, um, I don't know whether you ever had measles. You probably, you probably had the shots or something. Uh, no, but we had chicken pox and all that stuff, yeah. and we loved getting off school. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I, I had them all, uh, 
all the diseases and uh, you know we who grew up with it uh, most of the parents were pleased when you got them and you got over with them it's not harmless because if you if you're in bad have bad nutrition or live in bad conditions and get pneumonia it can be rather serious but ordinarily you know uh, people got all got over this rather easily but even now you know I don't even think it's up to 200 people in this country that's had it so uh, it seems like maybe the media is trying to scare us <laughs> oh no well I, if you look at it I bet you can find the money behind it they're gonna sell vaccines and and that sort of thing a recent case came up I think it were five or six kids in a nursery all got it but they were less than one and they don't give the shot until they're one anyway so I had nothing nothing to do with them not having their shots but uh, I worry as a physician and as trying to use common sense of these small babies getting huge inoculations with many many doses put together and close together because they say well they do okay and they didn't get this disease but I think that's a stress to the immune system and who knows what happens uh, you know later on and I think that's uh, one of the things that they that they don't count but uh, it, it to me is uh, is just part of this fear mongering well we just had it what a year not even a year ago on Ebola yeah, just a few months ago actually yeah, and, we were all supposed to get quarantined and vaccinated. and uh, there was immediate proposal to the Congress, yeah. boost up the appropriations, we need more research, and the companies that work on this, actually working for some of these vaccines, were getting uh, 50 million dollars a year, but they were talking about six or seven billion dollars additional into these funds in order to work on a vaccine. Well, it turned out that that was a fizzle too. And uh, I'm, I'm glad sometimes this stuff gets better faster. And I, I guess you saw this article that where the number of people either in Africa? It was in Africa. It was actually a World Health Organization report that in the worst affected countries in Africa, the infection rate is down more than 90 percent this this past week, as of this past week. Nature might be taking care of that. But there was another time when vaccines came up uh, and, and that had to do with the Persian Gulf War, a war that I strenuously opposed. But uh, a vaccine uh, was involved there and it had to do with, uh, I think it was cholera or uh, uh, one of the diseases they were immunizing them and so many people ended up with Persian Gulf War syndrome. What's the libertarian solution to this issue? <laughs> <laughs> well you know you can do this by freedom of choice individuals should make the decision but it becomes very complex when you have public schools public care for medical care because they'll say well we don't want to take a risk it's sort of like you wear a helmet because if you go to the emergency room we have to take care of you so if there, there's a risk in there so they own everything and they control everything and nobody makes a decision but in a free society the individual would you know if you're a homeschooler or if you have a, a private school a, a private school would have every right in the world to say you know, if you're not immunized uh, against uh, polio or whatever, you can't come to our school, and that would be handled that way. But uh, this this whole idea that they can deal with civil liberties in a state institution, it's absol absolutely impossible uh, to do that. But it's, it's this rejection of property and volunteerism and, and coming up with solution, who, who owns our bodies, and who has responsibility for children. And actually, I think the parents, in spite of some shortcomings of some, I think it's much better than the responsibility being given to the government. Besides, if you have an irresponsible government, and we tend in that direction at times, uh, the devastation from their bad choices is so much worse than allowing individuals to make these decisions. So I think it's, uh, it, it's something that uh, is very much a creature of uh, authoritarianism uh, where they have to have an authoritarian answer to everything everybody must do this so you know where my vote is <laughs> my votes for a, a freedom answer and uh, uh, a family and personal responsibility sounds so. good <laughs> the, uh, the other subject I wanted to visit with you a little bit and you've done a lot of work on it, and it has to do with foreign policy and the mess that I see us digging ourselves into and that is what's going on in, in Ukraine. Uh, I had the impression that not too long ago all of a sudden there was a declaration there is an emergency <laughs> we have to stop Putin. Did you get the impression that all of a sudden this seemed to pop out of nowhere and uh, now it's ongoing and threatening to get much worse? 
Sure, and actually, you know, it's been an ongoing kind of demonization. We saw it with Saddam Hussein and Gaddafi that, you know, Putin is Hitler, and this is the way, I think, of simplifying it for people to have an emotional reaction to these things. But you're right, it has been turned up, uh, the volume has been turned up quite a bit this week, and it's really interesting how it started, because I see this pattern all the time when you have an increase in intervention. Uh, the, uh, there was a study that came out from a think tank, and that always seems to spurn things, you know, and it said that if the U.S. is going to stop Russian aggression, we need to send $3 billion worth of defensive weapons to Ukraine, uh, you know. And are, they, are they non-lethal, non or are they lethal as well? I think they're lethal, but only in defense. Oh, okay. So they must have some software. But, you know, the, if you look, you scratch everyone, new think tank, the, think, the idea of a think tank, these are smart people, they're thinking so hard. But you scratch the surface, this think tank that put it out was completely uh, run by old Clinton appointees, Obama mm -hmm. appointees, Michelle Flournoy, who may well be Secretary of Defense in a Hillary Clinton administration, she was big in this. They're all funded by the military-industrial complex. I never guessed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, Poroshenko just the other day mentioned that I'm convinced that the United States will provide these weapons, $3 billion worth of weapon. And uh, I, I said, uh, yeah, I'm probably pretty convinced they will too, but I wouldn't say it's the United States because that's sort of vague. The American taxpayers are going to get stuck uh, for this, and who's going to be the most happy about this, of course, it's the people who get to build the weapons, which is a, a real tragedy. Right. But you know, Congress participates. This is the whole other thing. I think this is one of the things that I have to deal with for so long, and that is the pr war propaganda. Yeah. You know, whether it was back in the Persian Gulf War, which was in 1990, uh, you know, 90, 91, that, in that area, propaganda for war. And uh, I remember very clearly, you know, when they were building up the propaganda for going into Iraq uh, in 1998. It, it, but they always say, well, this resolution is for peace, yeah. you, you know. And, and, uh, but it was ongoing. I mean, the, the uh, description of these resolutions was always, you know, so wonderful. We bring about peace, but uh, they never talk about the consequences, which have been utterly tragic. So I think, I think this mess we have in the Middle East uh, started way back, uh, you know, in the in the early 1990s, and has continued. But the one the one that seems to be so unnecessary and popped up is this thing in in Ukraine. And every day, even this morning's paper had, well, we have to stop Russian aggression. And uh, I I don't know how they get away with this. And what, what about these accusations that, uh, you know, from uh, the Western Ukrainians that the Russians have soldiers on the ground there? Do you, do you think there's any evidence that they have soldiers on the ground? Well, I think Russia has admitted that there are individuals in their individual capacity that have gone over and volunteered. This is right next door. Many of them have relatives, very close relatives across the border. Uh, you know, remember these borders were kind of, they didn't, they didn't exist when there was a Soviet Union, so these are relatively new borders. So they, you know, they've admitted they're individuals, but they're saying the Russian army as such, there's absolutely no evidence that there's a battalion of Russians marching in with tanks and APCs. And, and the Russians have said, show us your evidence. You know, we've got satellites spying on our license plates we found out last week, you know. So there's no evidence of the accusations that Russia is about to march in into Poland and take over Europe. I mean, that to me is just uh, over the top. Well, you know, even the Ukrainian chief of general staff, one of the top ranking military officials in Ukraine said last week, there are no regular Russian military in Ukraine. We're fighting irregulars. So even their own military people ex uh, admit it. Well, you, you just pointed out some, you know, moral justification for, for people in Russia to be concerned about their relatives and they want to help. And that tends to be the case around the world. There's a lot of Americans go different places to help uh, groups that they're sympathetic to. But I would think that there's more justification there than, say, us, our special forces and our CIA being involved in contriving, you know, to uh, overthrow an elected government. Uh, you know, Yanukovych was overthrown. But how many Americans know this? That's, that's the thing we talked about earlier. The way the media reports it, everything started when, when Putin took over Crimea. The, the U.S. media never talks about the fact that there was a referendum in Crimea, and they certainly never talk about several months earlier when the U.S. Uh, supported this coup 
against an elected government in Ukraine. That's what started it because the people in the East said, hang on a minute, we voted for the guy in the West. We don't want him to be overthrown. This is undemocratic. <laughs> and they said, okay, if you're going to do that, then we're going to break away. They want to secede. They don't want to be part of an illegitimate system. You know, w when this started, I wanted to lean toward optimism. And I hope, I hope I can continue to do it. And my optimistic statement was, yeah, this is terrible. It's dumb, but they can't get anywhere. And I found all the statistics on trade that Russia had with Europeans, trade with Americans, our investments over there is in the two billions of dollars, a lot more with Europe than with, with us. And, you know, the saying that even the founders preach was that you, when you're trading with people and dealing with people, you're less likely to fight with people. And I thought, they're not going to do it. It's been so much better from what I remembered, uh, you know, during the uh, Korean War, how we dealt with problems with China. We were killing each other. And uh, as, as much as the criticism of Nixon was about going to China, I thought, what? Well, this is good, you know, and, and we're not about to bomb China. Hopefully we don't get there. But this, this whole thing about, uh, uh, you know, what, what's happening in Europe is, is interesting because uh, it seems to be escalating. At the same time, there's a lot of interest. We had a bunch of German business people saying, hey, hold off, this isn't good. But then we have NATO involved, the um, uh, United States involved, we have the European Union involved, and they're all saying we have to more sanction, more sanction. But some business people say, no, that's not put on sanction. And what about this? What do you think about, uh, you know, Merkel and Hollande going to Moscow? I, I think it, I'm keeping my fingers crossed. I hope my optimism will come through and they'll come to their senses. What some of the press has reported is especially Hollande was under a lot of pressure from the business community in France. Look, we don't, we, it, first of all, we do not want any provision of arms in Ukraine. That's, a, that's just adding fuel to the fire. But B, we need some relief from sanctions. This is a major trading partner, and following the U.S. is just suicidal at this point. So, as you point out, Merkel and Hollande went to Kiev and then went on to Moscow. And apparently from the media reports, the U.S. had no idea this was happening. They've been caught off guard. And so there's some speculation that they're trying to find a way out of this disaster. And, of course, the U.S. is just ratcheting it up. You know, in a way, we have to end up with some mixed feelings about this because I want the Europeans to wake up and reject this notion that they should do our bidding all the time. And yet at the same time, we as Americans think, well, that means you're putting America down. But, you know, I believe if we had a different foreign policy, it would be the most pro-American, pro-peace uh, policy that you could conceive of. So, yes, I hope the, the Europeans do what is in their best interest. And if it's saying that, America, we don't need your help any longer. And that, to me, is what we should be uh, seeking. And that is peace and prosperity. And uh, hopefully then you will continue your work in the Institute for Peace and Prosperity and, uh, and, and do get some information out there that you can't get on TV. But anyway, I want to thank everybody for tuning in to the uh, Ron Paul uh, Liberty Channel and Liberty Report. So please come back soon.